This week on Barbell Shrug, we're going to talk about core training, old school versus new school, anti-movement, unmovement, stability, and uh, programming for core training. Clap. Welcome to Barbell Shrug. I'm Mike Bleto here with Doug Larson and Chris Moore. You bet. Yeah. Sorry, guys. We don't have a guest today. Chris gonna... is our guest. Chris hasn't <laughs> been here in like a month. <laughs> yeah, I've been out. Feels for two, like three. we had to like catch you up on how we do things now. I'm like, how, where do I put my hands when I podcast? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it gets. It's pretty tough. He's gonna have to relearn how to how to hold the new sweet Barbell Shrug mugs that we just got. Ooh. We've been selling these mugs forever, and we haven't had them on a podcast for months. <laughs> they, make, they make the tea taste better. They do. Definitely. And actually, if you drink from this, you will be stronger. Because we put... It's because of the specialty. That's right. We're not telling you what's in it. No, we, we wrap up some drugs in the ceramic formula. <laughs> it leaches into whatever you drink. That's the explanation. <laughs> Shh, don't tell the government. <laughs> uh, Dimethylamylene or whatever that shit is in the ceramic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do we want to talk about today? Core training. Core training. Core training. Oh, boy. Yeah. I don't even know what that means. What does that mean, Mike? It means we're going to make the flabby part into a six-pack. Spring yeah. break's coming up. Yeah. Is this mm-hmm. the... This is maybe... In seven the, months. Is this the big, meatiest pillar of the buzzword modern fitness culture that we've taken on directly? Have we had another... Have we done like a functional training episode yeah. yet? Did I don't know what you're talking exactly. about. I was just going to say function, power, <laughs> speed, <CrossFit>. core, shreddedness. <laughs> <laughs> but core training still is, I, I've been disassociated from pop culture and the fitness world for a long time now. I have absolutely no clue and I like that, but yeah. is this still a thing? I think it's still a big buzzword. Core is still <laughs> core training. intoxicates people. I think core training and, and functional tr- functional fitness or functional training are still the, like, the two is big Juan buzzwords Carlos that nobody Santana really knows what the hell guy? they mean. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't. <laughs> is he still doing his thing? <laughs> he's been since like 2005 since so I even mentioned that guy's name, but he's popped in my memory. I haven't seen him present in a while. But yeah, yeah he, I have no idea. You know what? In, in his defense, he does he does a lot of like the core training stuff, but it, it's always like the little stuff in between all the really important stuff that he just assumes everyone already knows how to do. So I, th- I think people give him a bad rap sometime and they're like, all he does is push-ups on med balls. And it's like, no, like I think he he does heavy sets of squats and then as like his in-between movement, he'll go do yeah. you know Which something something yeah, something does, novel. But does he attribute it to the novel movement? I don't think so. I think look at the guy, he's huge, he's a big strong dude. I don't think he got that from doing push-ups on med balls. He's got a big head, I'll give you that. Yeah, you know, he looks like a big strong guy. I've heard him speak a couple times. Like I I like what he says. In a lot of cases. Of course, I'm just joking. Yeah, the guy's pr- probably perfectly fine, gentlemen. <laughs> I'm sure it's a big, nice, very super nice training facility with lots of cable machines that cost more than you know my car is worth. Probably That's <laughs> yeah. probably very accurate. Oh, yeah. Man, you just brought up a really good point. I just started thinking about what my cars are worth, and none of them... You could not buy like, one... I couldn't buy one treadmill. You couldn't the, buy one pneumatic gyms. chest press machine, no. could you? No. <laughs> I'd, have, I'd have to sell three cars then get one of those <laughs> so, right, yeah. so, so yeah. what is core training mike and yeah. by the way I, I do have a truck for sale if anyone's looking to buy it don't 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 <laughs> shoot <your functions. laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll pose this to you because you you tweeted somebody challenged you to or you challenged somebody else to give a, ph- ph- uh, a political comment in the 140 characters less so i'll do the same to you core training in tweet form that is your definition how do you say it? <sighs> super quick Define it in 140 characters or less. Not that I can core, check. Core training? Yeah. Define it in one sentence. Training the musculature that is your core. That's <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. There you go. No, That's no, it. That's no. all. all right, you guys can uh, turn the podcast off now. Can you point to your core? <laughs> From right. It's a trick question. And, it's between the nipples and the genitalia. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, jeez. All right. Um, yeah, that was about it. 
<laughs> right, so, so essentially talk- a, a training philosophy that, that puts maybe at a heightened focus uh maybe a an or an inordinate amount of focus on training the muscles of the midsection of your body yeah I mean, well I mean, actually if you look back if you look back we're going to talk a little bit about old school versus new school you look back at some of the like flex magazine and the core training um that you'll get out of one of those and a lot of it's you know sit-ups and like all those variations of like of a uh, core flexion, I guess you could call it. Or My, the classic mm-hmm. standing, standing up yeah. with a dumbbell, do a little side crunches. Right, right. Yeah, maybe yeah. You have two dumbbells. You do this, which so just doesn't the, make any sense, but you do this. <laughs> yeah, like, like <laughs> I've actually seen. <laughs> I was all I saw, I saw some power lifters doing that one day. They had the dumbbell in each hand, and we're going back and forth. I was like, "This is retarded. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on?" Try grabbing one dumbbell with one hand and then do the same thing. See if that works better. See if that works better. Yeah, so it seems like the, the old school way or, or the bodybuilding way is to isolate the core. So mm-hmm. I try, to, try to find out which muscles are in the core and then isolate them and then flex them as hard as you can. Yeah. So you're so. doing abs, basically, is exactly. what most people think. Yeah. So you're doing lots of sit-ups. So you got your obliques. Trying to work, work your six-pack. Yeah, you got your obliques. Got your and obliques. You got the rectus. They all work individually. Abdominus. There you go. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> it's too late in the day for all my, you. All my kinesiology knowledge. Thanks. Just, just float it away. A- a- after 5 p.m. No, no good. Yeah. But of course, it does include training the, the muscles of the back as well. I mean, it's. Yeah, it's just, I, I think that gets left out a lot. Yeah. People talk about core and they automatically assume it's your six pack. Maybe, I mean, maybe the oblique. These too. muscles don't function yeah. independent of these muscles when it comes to you doing something. That's a sporting movement. Right. Let's all be clear in this readership. Yeah, so in a, from a bodybuilding perspective or, you know, like if you're if you're trying to have like a six-pack for the beach, you can isolate those muscles and try and, and cause like some muscle growth. So you'll do a lot of reps. And, and good luck with that. Yeah. I mean, and it'll probably work. I mean, I spent probably a decade of my life doing abs pretty, doing abs pretty consistently. And they look pretty good. <laughs> so I, until I got married, and I got married, and then, uh, blame, you know, blame but I'm life. not sure that had anything to do with the training. So. We know these big life moments, like getting married and having kids, apparently your testosterone goes down, maybe some evolutionary incentive for you to not go rambling. That's a real thing, dude. <laughs> Brian, you have a kid, Brian Schilling was telling me about this. You have this. a kid, your testosterone yeah. mysteriously does go down. It's a control mechanism to keep you in the house watching the baby. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not lying. Go... St- Go to, everybody who's listening. Go to PubMed. Type in a series of keywords: <laughs> baby, male, <laughs> testosterone, uh, neutering, whatever you want to put in there. It will come up. The evidence. So that's why the abs go away. It could be a contributing factor. That and you sit on a couch eating ding dings or something. You know, yeah, that could too. that could be it. And was it a uh, was it Paul Quinn put something together about uh, where you hold fat? I think you're more familiar oh, yeah. with this than I am. He put that together like you know if you hold fat. Mm-hmm. In your upper body, then you probably have more estrogen around your belly. That might be, or yeah, I don't, it, it I don't have to, all of it memorized. It had but more to do with diet than it did with types of training. Yeah, Paul can put together his whole biosignature modification system. Where uh, I don't know exactly how he did it, but he took, from what I know, he took maybe like twenty years of data and he he <clears throat> correlated all of the blood work that he'd done with all of his high level athletes in Canada over the last couple decades and. Uh, and he showed that, um, you know, so many people with depressed cortisol, for example, had a lot of trouble when they took their skin fold measurements, when they're measuring their body fat, at losing um, like abdominal subcutaneous fat. And people that had um, trouble with um, with their insulin levels had problems with this part of their body or the other part of their body. And I don't remember exactly which hormone correlated to which area of their body or, or which individual skin fold measurements. But um, from what I know, a lot of people follow um his his correlations and, and that system and have gotten a lot of value out of it and you know when someone's trying to lose body fat and they're they're losing it overall but they might not be losing it in one spot or another or they can go make very specific changes to their diet to modify those those very specific hormones if they're not losing fat in a very particular area so i've never done it myself and i'm not an expert in it i know he has some certifications for that 
Uh, but go, go ahead and Google about biosignature modification and see what comes up. Everyone go spend money on that certification <laughs> yeah, I now. Yeah, how much that cert is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably no, no more than any other cert, really. But <laughs> yeah. even, even uh, you know, CrossFit's 800 bucks or $1,000, however much it is these days. Yeah. I mean, they're all good certs. They're, they're plenty of hit, value, but hit, they're, they're definitely not cheap. Hit point one. Point one, yeah. Talk about old school versus new school. We actually haven't talked about new school core training yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that kind of falls into the whole functional uh part of things you know uh is is doing crunches and side bends and all that kind of stuff functional is that new school what no no, no that's old school, uh, old school. Well, i'm, I'm, talking, talking, about, about new I'm school, talking about like yeah. isolating movements is kind of old school and new school is more of the like, functional is like you know you're doing all over, the balancing stuff and over, the stabilization stuff yeah and, overhead squats like you gotta like you know say you double your your body weight you know by putting oh overhead you, you're talking and, but but a, a different arc like our arc like, approach to like core a new training. school yeah like like how we do core training now Honestly, new school meaning all the bullshit people try to sell now to train your core like uh, no 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 bosu ball banded uh, external no, rotation well, infomercial, infomercial core training yeah that's talk about that too. so new school is basically what we know to be <laughs> all right we talk about old school performance We're, training for the abs we'll do new school in a minute let's talk about infomercial <laughs> okay that's fun core part. training well, I kind of put infomercial yeah. core training in the old school category because most of it is just, it's like buy the crunch machine and you do a thousand crunches a day and you're yeah. going to get six pack abs. It's easy. They always, yeah. infomercial always sells like how hard it's not. <laughs> like, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, this won't be hard for you at all. This, you and, won't even know what you're doing. You'll be you'll just be watching TV. You'll be watching Game of Thrones and getting a six pack at the same time. The best place for these gimmicks is like the Sky Mall catalog. They got some crazy stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. Training guy, like, you know, while you're sitting on a toilet, wrap this thing around and simulate it. It plug it into the toilet and it simulate your abs. While you're like all kinds of things don't make any sense. Like one thing they sell is a Every time you low flush. back stretcher and ab uh, isolating machine. It's a, a, a like a T shaped metal thing with like two curved metal brackets that like tie into it, and like the T shaped thing has a handle. So I guess you just hold it and you just put your thighs around it, and then. They showed a guy just laying on the floor with that in his legs, like back stretch. I go, back stretch. And then uh, they show <laughs> they show her holding this, this lady, she's holding it, and she's like doing this on the floor, like isolate your abs. <laughs> like it's just it's it was a bizarre, like a hundred dollar piece of metal that I'm sure somebody probably scooped that up off the old online catalog immediately. And all yeah. kinds of bizarre little battery powered stimulators. Like the old Russian stem units, but you, some twenty dollar thing you put on your abs and it's going to give you abs by causing muscle quivers and you know, all that kind of stuff. It's brilliant. It is. All right, that was easy. So we'll, we'll close that. We'll close that point by saying, just ignore all that. You know. All right, and new school is more of the, uh, I guess. Uh, wow, I'm like uh, 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 anti flexion, mm-hmm. um, anti well not anti flexion. Well, I guess it would be. Yeah, anti- anti-flexion is what you would do in, in a squat or a deadlift or anything else. Right. Anytime you're not rounding your back when you have a when you're doing front squats, overhead squats, deadlifts, RDLs, or anything like that is is anti-flexion. That would be you're the core. Trying- the core you can't see. Yeah, I mean it's just the the core muscles that are on your back instead of on the front of you, like your abs. I mean yeah. your your spinal erectors are core muscles, like you said before. Anything that's any muscles that are in between your hips and your shoulders, basically anything on your torso and your trunk is your your core muscles. And the main role of those in, in real athletics is to keep your spine from moving. So when we're talking about doing heavy squats and deadlifts, it's keeping your spine from going into flexion. Right. So it's anti-flexion. And then the other types of movements your spine could do is it could go into extension or it could go into lateral flexion like side bending or it could rotate. And so you have those other functions of your core muscles too where you have resisting flexion like we just, like we just mentioned. We have resisting extension. Which is like if you snake off the ground in a push up, you hyper extend your back and then you know push away from the floor and then you come back to the top. And if you stayed nice and straight and you resisted that extension, then you would stay straight all the way the whole time without snaking. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you have very weak abs, then you're and you're not strong enough to keep a straight neutral spine, then you're you're missing out on on that that benefit, that muscular benefit of resisting extension. And then you're throwing your back into hyperextension, which is kind of wearing on your back the same way, except the opposite direction that it would if you were rounding your back when you're doing your squatting. Uh, and then you get very practical things, like if you go for a 30-minute walk, you get cramps in your lower back because you 
you start losing position. So it, it directly affects your quality of life on every level. Mm-hmm. And if you can't keep these positions, it's why yeah. you train. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's actually a really interesting point where anytime, you know, like if you're walking, you're on one leg and then, and then you're on two legs for a second, then you're on one leg again. Anytime you're on one leg in single leg stance, you're doing some type of core training. If you're on one leg, it kind of makes sense that uh, if your pelvis is, I have any good props here. Uh, just, if you're on, this is your pelvis. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. drop it. <laughs> Yeah. This is your pelvis. I broke it. On <laughs> not core training. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> brilliant point, coach. <laughs> so if you're on one leg, then one side of your hip is being supported by the leg that's on the ground, and the other hip should just fall down, and your pelvis shouldn't be flat to the floor anymore. It should kind of fall out. Um, but if you have strong core musculatures, strong hip muscles on your side, and strong obliques kind of on the opposite side, then those muscles can contract, and it can level your pelvis out again. So doing... You know, yoke. Yeah, doing yoke That's a walks. good segue into what we may both agree is maybe the best core exercise you could possibly conceive of. It really is. Which Super is- heavy carries are very hard on your core musculature, especially lateral anti-flexion type muscles that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, just a second well, ago. Let's cover this real quick. Let's talk about the, the different, what, what exactly your core is responsible for. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's say four. So you have anti-extension, mm-hmm. uh, anti-rotation, mm-hmm. uh, anti-flexion right and then uh i guess like it was, it was anti-lateral flexion yeah you almost had it flexion. so you're not so yeah. dumb yeah <laughs> so yeah so we, so we talk about anti-flexion anti-extension i have it written down somewhere i don't have to memorize it's in my these ever things. note <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> uh, and then we briefly talked about anti-lateral flexion which probably the 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 easiest way to really feel that one is to to do a very heavy one arm farmer's walk, like a suitcase carry. If you put 150 pounds or put like body weight in one hand and try to walk around with it, it's going to want to pull you to the side and you're going to have to resist that lateral flexing motion. And you're really going to feel that, especially on your, you know, kind of your obliques on the opposite side. So you're resisting lateral flexion. Uh, the other one is um, anytime you're keeping your shoulders and your hips facing the same direction, then you are, and you're being, you're, you're, you have a force acting on you trying to make your you rotate, excuse me, uh, then you're training resisting rotation. Uh, that basically, uh, in sport, the time that that would happen most frequently would be any time you're throwing something in rotation. If you're spinning and you're, and you're throwing something or, uh, or if you're, um, you know, someone's pushing like on one shoulder and you're, you're resisting that motion, then... Like what an offensive lineman may do when they're blocking. Exactly, yeah. Or anytime you're pushing somebody with one arm then all of all of this has to contract that way when you push on them you don't just rotate as you extend your arm that, that would include even something like golf oh, yeah. yeah and that's actually was it one reason golfers end up with back injuries is because they have a weak core and and mm-hmm. their joints are not they don't have mobility where they need it so they end yeah. up sacrificing at their core causing back problems yeah, so this all this all plays into that that joint by joint concept that I've mentioned on, on a bunch of shows um, or on a bunch of episodes and and in the mobility seminar. And basically, what that says is that you have you have joints that are supposed to move, and those are your mobile joints. In the case of golfers, um, they tend to get low back pain in a lot of cases because they can't rotate at their hips very well, and they can't rotate their thoracic spine, their upper back, very well. And so the stable joint, kind of quote unquote, the stable joint in the middle is their low back. And if they can't rotate at the joints above and below that, then they'll destabilize their low back and they'll rotate the low back and they'll injure their low back. So stability means being strong enough not to move. And we just talked about anti-lateral flexion, anti-rotation, anti-extension, anti-flexion. So those anti-movement properties of your core musculature are basically stability-based. You're training your core musculature to keep your back in a neutral position where it's not flexed or rotated at all. But if you lack mobility and you can't get the range of motion from your hips, then you're going to try to get it somewhere just to get the movement accomplished. And so even if you have a strong core, since you just need to get the movement done, you'll intentionally turn those muscles off just so you can go through the range of motion necessary to hit a ball or throw something or or what have you. I think that's a mistake a lot of people make. They're like, oh, my back hurts because I have poor core strength. It's like, Mm -hmm. well, maybe more of a mobility issue than a than a strength issue mm-hmm. oh. word yeah yeah it's absolutely true if, if you put really somebody true. through um, through a range of motion that they can do with perfect technique then they usually can do you know with without they usually can go through that range of motion through you know with a, a decent weight for them 
um, for an appropriate number of reps, and they would only break down their technique on the very, very, very last few sets. That, you know, when they're when their legs are starting to fatigue, their back starts to fatigue, and it all kinds of kind of starts to fatigue together. But if you have them go extra low, like you make them go lower than they're supposed to, then they'll start rounding their back before they're tired, and they'll start having their knees dive in before they're tired. And that doesn't mean they have a weak core; it just means that well, they don't have the range of motion to do it at all. And if right. they don't have the range of motion to do it at all, then no amount of effort or coaching or cueing or yelling at them or or them having the knowledge that you know they're supposed to keep their back tight is going to help. The same way that if you have, if someone says, "Hey, put your foot behind your head," if you just can't do it, then you just can't do it. And no <laughs> amount of coaching or cueing or telling them what to do or them trying is going to make it happen. They just don't have the range of motion to get it done. Yeah. So the same thing if you tell someone to hit a rock bottom squat. If they don't have the range of motion at their at their ankles, their hips, and their thoracic spine for extension <laughs> to get it done, then they just can't do it. Reminds me yesterday when McGordick was yelling at somebody. He's uh, somebody was doing Fran. He goes, "Breathe! Come on, breathe!" <laughs> yeah, I he's go, telling David that you yelling at him won't help him breathe. He can't <laughs> breathe. <laughs> he just can't. He's look what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> like yelling more won't go. I'll go oh yeah you're right <sighs> casual breathing <laughs> I was like me like, when I tried to like I was trying to do toes to bar like in the spring <laughs> like somebody goes come on just just touch your toes to the bar I don't understand I go I go Look at me. <laughs> I have a me- my, my mechanically my thighs and belly are hitting. This is, won't happen. <laughs> so yeah, I agree. Some things just aren't mm-hmm. going to happen with, unless you take some profound long term interventions. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, <laughs> we, we, we can right? hear Ashley. Ashley's downstairs laughing. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say on the kind of on the uh, the other side of that coin, if you do have very poor core strength then what will happen is your your body can actually lay down um, stiffness at your mobile joints as compensation for lack of stability okay so if you're a very immobile person and you're also not very strong and you're trying to you know learn all these new crossfit movements and and you know get better and have more range of motion for these yogis out there (coughs) yeah well you, you can get more range of motion sometimes you know by by doing yoga and things like that but Oftentimes, you're not going to do well under load right. um, if you don't have stability as well. So right. I'm saying this is, for, this is a message to the yogis. Okay. So, so anyway. <laughs> He's like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, if you don't have very good, um, very good core stability and, you, and as a result, you compensate and you lay down stiffness at those mobile joints, then even if you try to stretch those mobile joints, but you don't work on your stability, it's going to be hard to make the, that change in mobility stick because your body still, since it's not very stable at the stable joints, is laying down more stiffness at the mobile joints. So you can't just stretch or just work on stability. you got to do it both at the same time, which is kind of a roundabout way of saying you should have good technique all the time. Right on. Very cool. <laughs> that, 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 was, that was mine. You stole, that, you stole that my was, thing. Makes two strong points. And, and, no and, rebuttal and, from the gallery. Inside joke. Anytime I'm not listening to somebody, I say right on, right on, and then I walk away. <laughs> Which at least Dude, that, was, that, was, that was pretty funny. You told everybody your secret just now. So I know. You well, screwed. well, everyone learned it a while back. I, I changed it to something else anyway. <laughs> now figure out the new word. Yep. Uh, let's let's go ahead and take a break real quick, and we'll come back. We're going to talk about. Uh, how to program for core strength. All right. Mike Bledsoe here with Technique Wad in St. Louis at the Lab Gym with Justin Thacker. We're going to do some uh, weightlifting to warm up progressions. So the first thing we're going to look at is the snatch uh, position stretches. And each one of these positions is basically to loosen up and kind of give you a static hold to warm up the start position, the overhead receiving position, and the overhead full uh, squat position. So the first one's going to be the squatting quad stretch. So he's going to get a snatch grip. He's going to put the bar at about mid-thigh. He's going to be in a starting stance here with flat feet and, or way back towards the heels a bit. He's going to squat down as low as you can in position there with the bar about mid-thigh. And our first goal here is to get an ankle, knee, and hip stretch here. But then the next piece is if you can get into a start position there to kind of turn on those back muscles a bit and to tilt the hips a bit. <laughs> so it's not easy at all. So once he gets in there, first goal is, is to get in that position. He can bring the bar up a little bit higher. But then if you can then begin to emulate your start position a little bit and get taller and then bring the head up just a tad, those arms can be soft there, but basically you want to get a good stretch there and you want to feel the center of gravity in your foot to where you can almost start standing up or taking off from there and actually do the lift. We'll get to that one next, but first you just for 10 seconds, he's going to stand up 
to put the bar overhead and almost do a muscle snatch to get there. You're gonna lock out his overhead position. And depending on how you like to receive the bar, you can go there or even turn that was through a tad. E either way, you're gonna get nice and tight like you're receiving a 600 pound real heavy snatch there. So everything's nice and tight and activated, tight through the middle. Knees can be slightly unlocked there. So just as if you caught that rip. You're gonna hold this tight for 10 seconds. Then he's gonna ride it straight down into overhead squat and hold for 10. We'll hold this for 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So that's one round. He's going to go back to the start again. So snatch grip, squatting quad stretch, 10 seconds here. So it's 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Then back to the overhead. We'll fight for 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Then overhead squat. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good. And recover. So you, you can just continue to just keep hitting sets of that until things start feeling loose and limber. And if, if you have any kind of chronic positional problems, any shoulder issues there, you can start to work on them simply with the bar when you're not having to do anything with speed and kind of risk injury there. So you can kind of, coach, you can kind of come in and clean up each and every little position there, or you can kind of fill out yourself there, taking time for 10 second holds. So I like to do one round of that would be uh, 30 total seconds or about three rounds at least before each workout. And we're back. <laughs> More talking about core training. Core training. So um, we we were just talking a little bit about. I have no idea what we were talking about before the break, but we're gonna go into. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna span of a Reese's monkey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, the program. We're gonna talk about programming a little bit, and we want to talk about. Uh, so maybe our favorite movements or our favorite maybe unmovements. For training the core, mm -hmm. unmovements. Unmovements. That's a new one. New term. <laughs> Anti movement core training. Unmovement. Un core tra unmovement. <laughs> <laughs> Is it deloading or unloading? I hate that shit. Or anti unmoving. <laughs> so <laughs> unmoving. <laughs> Okay, so Whoa, that's a whole that's a whole training program we could put together. We call it the anti unmoving training program. Anti kinetic training. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh -huh. Sit on the couch. <laughs> what we do is we save up a bunch of potential energy. Fat. All right, so uh, we'll talk about let's talk about uh, anti flexion first or anti extension. Sorry, okay. anti extension first, and I guess we will dive right in. Uh, most popular okay. anti extension movement in CrossFit would be the GHD setup. So yeah, I guess, um, so. And that, I guess it's the most forceful one, right? That's yeah, I, a bitch of an exercise. It will fire you up. It'll make I, you pee. I have actually heard of more cases of rhabdo yeah, it'll give you the due, to, due to that movement over anything else. They say mm -hmm. GHD sit-ups and then behind that's like jumping pull-ups. Oh. Yeah. And the jumping pull-up is because they're not doing a real jumping pull-up. It's probably, because they're letting themselves down too slow. Add to that the, uh, I don't know what you officially call it, basically planking with the rings or like, uh, like Marcy does on the, with her elbows on the rower. So basically throwing yeah. it right out in front of you and keeping a flat uh, back. Oh, you're talking about just a ab rollout. Yeah, like, just like yeah. a week, you know, grab yeah, a basically. wheel or a barbell or a set. Of yeah, rings. I, did, I did them on the rows, yeah. like three weeks ago, or the rings, right? As you know, with a little bit of a bent elbow position, just sort of and standing, just sort of spilled out just enough where I started going, <laughs> and then ratcheted it back. So it's like two sets of ten, and then was sore for like a week and a half. Yeah, I actually programmed that. Uh, pretty frequently with our CrossFitters, so the yeah, the I mean, ring fantastically hard. Ring, and effective. We call them uh, ring fallouts if we do them with the rings. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we do them on a barbell, we just call them rollouts, ab rollouts. Or mm -hmm. we've got a wheel or two floating around the gym. Mm -hmm. um, I like those for anti extension for um, the classes. I have I really don't program the GHD sit ups, which is a big anti extension um, for the regular classes too much, just because too many people have. Like mm -hmm. jack themselves up, you know. Two reasons: one, uh, it causes a, a large range of motion, probably a range of motion that your abs have probably never experienced before. So it's it's got a lot of potential to cause damage. And the other, just a lot of eccentric loading mm -hmm. um, there also. Well, that you have to spend really? like 15 minutes of your class trying to get people confident enough to to fly back without feeling like they're going to fall off the mm -hmm. thing. Most people don't need to be doing it. It takes experience to do that well. Yeah, and and. People that have back problems, you know, throw them on a GHD machine and have, all right, uh, go into hyperextend, hyperextend your back and Violently. then flex it, you know, <laughs> as fast as possible under, as under the load of you your can. body. So, yeah, it's it's not the safest thing. It's probably something I would have never done for speed had it not been for CrossFit. 
uh, I had done uh, sit-ups on a GHD prior to discovering CrossFit, but it was like slow, methodical, and we would weight them. Um, and then Doug was talking about, we talked about a little bit in the break, how um, people doing sit-ups, period. We just talk about sit-ups in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and now that we're talking about like anti-extension and sit-ups fall in that category, and the dangers people run into with their their pelvis and not being able to rotate sit-ups sit-ups are considered flexion like trunk flexion right so it wouldn't be anti-extension uh, it wouldn't be anti-extension yeah just because you're flexing doesn't mean you're training anti-extension necessarily so i actually i wouldn't even put gsc sit-ups in that category for that reason just because you're just because you're working your abs doesn't mean you're you're training anti-extension because the GHC sit-ups going from flexed to extended or even hyper extended for most people and then back into flexion you're moving your spine a lot it's not anti-movement at all it's a lot of movement it's probably more movement than you get with yeah. any any other ab exercise so to speak yeah so the fallouts and the, and the rollouts that stuff i would consider anti-extension because you're not getting a lot of lumbar movement you're just you're you're putting your hands out in front of you if you're you know doing like a ab wheel rollout and you're in that 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 position where you could fall into lumbar extension if if your abs weren't strong enough and you're you're trying to maintain a position rather than moving this area at all. Um, so for sit ups, I would I would consider yeah, that to I be that, trunk flexion rather than anti extension. Yeah, same muscles, but different yeah. thing is hap- Different action is happening. Right, it's a right. different action. So it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that that GHC sit ups are, are are bad and only anti extension are good. It's just kind of a different classification. And the thing about um, resisting or anti-movement is it's primarily an isometric contraction where the muscle's trying to actively shorten, but it's not actually changing length. And you tend not to get a lot of muscle damage like that. And so you tend not to get a very potent growth response. So it doesn't make you sore and it doesn't really hypertrophy or, or make those muscles grow. So, I mean, if you're trying to grow your core, a lot of people aren't, then that's great. Uh, but if you're if you're trying to gain muscle mass and you're, or you're trying to win a physique contest and you want to you know hypertrophy your abs and and you know get some deeper cuts or anything like that, <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> then you want to get shredded. Then you, then you could you could do that. Deep cuts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, there's nothing wrong with working the muscles, um, right? But it's not primarily how we think about training. We tend to think about movements or anti movement. So if you want big abs specifically, big abs GHD setups are the way to go. It, it, it'll make them grow. Yeah. I'll give them that because it's going to make them real sore. Yeah, because they, they do have that damage. big eccentric stress yeah. through a big range of motion, a big stretch at the bottom. All right. So that's, uh, we'll, we'll say GHD sit ups. That'd be uh, probably your biggest uh, core flexion exercise. And then mm-hmm. say ab rollouts, um, ring, ro- ring fallouts, whatever you want to call them. Those would be mm-hmm. a big anti extension. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Any other big anti extension ones? I mean, really, anytime you're maintaining a plank or push up position, you're, you're for the most part, yeah. if you're in the right position, so you're then you're training, you're training anti extension. Yeah. yeah. But a lot of people, a lot of people just rest in that position with a hyper extended lumbar spine and a bent hip. So they're not really training anti extension because they're hyper extended the whole time. So assuming you're doing, you're in a good spot and you're doing the push up correctly, you know, go to the technique wide episode on push ups. I think I mentioned that very specific thing. Uh, then yes, you're training anti extension. So if you're if you're doing push ups and you're kind of slacking in your core, mm-hmm. then you're doing it yourself. Fix that shit, bro. Yeah, yeah if you're doing yourself what you're doing, you're doing yourself a disservice. So you mm-hmm. get more out of yeah. your training. Don't take shortcuts with stuff like that. Don't think oh it's only a push up. Focus on what you're doing. I guess even if you're experienced. Yeah, a lot a lot of people I think are going for time. You know, they just want to like, all right, this is how the beginning of the rep looks, and this is how the end of the rep looks. So and as long as get you get there. from A to B, it doesn't matter how you got there. Now, from a from a training perspective, it does matter. If you're in a competition, I say, you know, rules go out the window. Sounds good training, for re- do <clears throat> refrigerator magnet quotes. Get to point A, point B. It doesn't matter how you get <laughs> or whatever. But in that's, actuality, that's, that's why I'm going to run for office one day. Yeah. I'm good with those. Mm. I'll get I'll get us where we need to go. Don't ask me how I'll do it. <laughs> Close your eyes and look away. No one ever does. <laughs> Um, uh, and actually on, on the, on the, the note about sit-ups, like I wasn't really going to talk about sit-ups, but, um, I'm going to say a quick thing about that. So most people, when they do core training, you know, they do hundred sit-ups in the morning and hundred sit-ups before they go to bed and, and then they get to the gym and this they do more and more and more sit-ups and that's all, that's all they ever do is sit-ups, 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 right? Uh, you know, a lot of people have kind of bastardized sit-ups over the years saying, well, you don't really work your abs. You're, it's all hip flexion. It's all working your hip flexors as if working your hip flexors was bad for some reason. <laughs> um, but, um, a lot of people have, you know, 
gone on rants about how bad sit-ups are <coughs> for your for your low back. Um, you know, Stuart McGill's come out come out. You know, when he wrote all of his low back books about um, how you know repeated lumbar flexion is basically going to give you a give you a, some type of a um, of a bulging disc or something eventually if you don't have one already, which a lot of people do even though, even if they don't know it. But anyway, uh, uh, Mike Boyle a while back put out an interesting uh, an interesting video where there he was talking about um, most people that are doing sit ups. You know, they're heavy, especially especially guys tend to have a lot of their weight in their upper body, and so. Just from a balance perspective and a center of mass perspective, they uh, if they have a lot of weight up top, in order to sit all the way up, you have to get to your center of mass on that side of your hips in order to pull you all the way up. So you can try this. If you lie on your back and you try to do a sit-up with your feet really, really, really close to your butt, you know that, that raises your center of mass up. And then you try to sit up to the top and you can't do it at all. Mm-hmm. But if you put your feet all the way straight out in front of you, it's, it's similar to anchoring your feet on a kettlebell or something. When you anchor your feet on a kettlebell or you do a sit-up with straight legs, your center of mass is really far down. So it's really easy to pull yourself up. What happens, though, for a lot of people is in order to get their center of mass down is they curl their trunk. Oh. And by curling their trunk and going into maximum lumbar flexion, now their center of mass is low enough where they can actually sit up. But in order to sit up at all, they have to maximally flex their trunk. And when they maximally flex their trunk, that's when they're they're bending their back and they're they're stretching, you know, all the muscles on the back side of their spine, or not muscles, but the, all the ligaments on the back side of their spine, uh, and they're putting themselves at risk for a bulging disc because they have to they have to take all their ab strength to flex their spine just to put themselves in a balanced position where they can actually sit up. That that shit makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So that makes well, that, that's, good that's, sense. So that's really what I thought when I read that. I was like, "Holy shit, he's fucking right." It's it, not. Man. It's not the. Uh, it's not that sit ups are bad for you. It's How the technique. Yeah. Again, if you practice proper technique, there's nothing yeah. wrong with it. So if you if you lack flexibility and or have a very large upper body, I would recommend extending your feet and kind of externally rotating where you're, you're pushing your knees out a little bit. It'll make it a little bit easier on your hips, just like pushing your knees out super wide or having a really wide stance when you squat makes it easier to, to kind of sit into the hole. It's easier to flex your hip. Uh, so if you're a big person, then uh, it'll help you to anchor your feet. <laughs> it'll help you to anchor your feet or yeah. to extend your legs a lot to bring your center of mass down, and then it won't be quite as hard on your spine. Would you say, Doug, that I have a big upper body? Yeah, no. it's bulging. You have a ridiculous. I'm just, I'm just wondering. You have a childlike <laughs> physique. <laughs> uh, then the, that's, the that's other point I got there, out of it. I was like, I was like, the whole time you were talking, I was thinking, I was like, like I can't get is, up on a sit up. Must be because my arms is. So huge. <laughs> is that why I can't do sit ups? <laughs> These huge pecs and shoulders. <laughs> my yoke, <laughs> my yoke is too thick. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing is that you shouldn't do sit ups every single day of your life. You, you have other options, which we're going to talk about next. Would you do shoulder presses every day? Probably not. Yeah. Do you squat every day? Yes. If you're Chris Moore, then it's yes. Exception. But the rest of the world, probably not. Like you wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't train hard on. on you wouldn't squat do the day. same load or the same volume every single day. You would, you, that, you would no. vary it in some way. You might so, squat heavy one day and then do bodyweight squats in your nor- in your warm up the next day. So this is actually something Doug introduced me to, and, and it, I started using it when uh not when I program for weightlifters and and anyone who's doing like sports specific training is, you know, on day one you have anti extension. Day two. Uh, anti-rotation, day three, anti-lateral uh, flexion. You're achieving so, a balance. Right. So you can train the core every single day without uh, overtraining the core, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. That way... That's funny. Man, it reminds me of the, the approach I was taking over the last year or so with squats, to about squatting frequently. Oh, yeah. And you said how you don't do it the same way. One thing I realized is that if I combine squats strategically strategically and did them all heavily but differently in a sort of sequence way and get good result meaning that if i did a like a paused box squat mm-hmm. on day one that i sit back further it's a little more hip dominant it's a little more lower back dominant <laughs> that's going to be really tough to to recover from if on the next day or the day after that i also did something that was low back dominant like a another low bar back squat but if i do let's say a front squat on that day I'm squatting heavy, like a squat heavy to max, very heavy stuff, but now my thoracic spine and maybe a little more quadricep is being taxed. So I'm doing the same looking thing, but they're complementary exercises. Like yeah. if I'm doing, makes sense to what they're saying. If mm-hmm. I'm doing an ab exercise, I'm training abs every day, 
but if they're fundamentally different ways of doing it, then the sum of those things is a comprehensive training of your abs. Yeah, absolutely. So it's that a good way approach you, you can train, train your, your core every day, but just keep it different. Don't do yeah. anti-extension every day of the week. I endorse mm-hmm. that approach. So. <laughs> <laughs> we need some more of that on the podcast. Uh, <laughs> All right, so we did anti-extension, anti-flexion. Anti-flexion was doing squats and deadlifts and things like that. Anything where you're trying to to keep yourself out of rounding your back. Uh, right. So we'll, get, we'll talk about anti-lateral flexion now. Okay. And that would be like a, a single arm farmer's carry. So that's, you, that's my favorite one by you far. Pick, you pick up a lot of weight on one <clears> arm <throat> and you keep yourself from falling over sideways. Yeah, a one arm a one arm, one arm farmer's walk and then for that matter, any kind of farmer's walk or yoke walk. <clears throat> yeah, anything yeah. Anytime really, you're walking. Really cannot beat those for just building strength. Mm-hmm. Uh, the favorite thing I did when I, the, the point I was going to make earlier is that when I started powerlifting, I assumed because the guys I was around did that you had to do, you had to do a bunch of ab exercises. You did a bunch of, uh, sometimes I did this dumbbell back and forth, mumbo jumbo, uh, a lot of crunches, a lot of weighted sit-ups, a lot of spread eagle sit-ups, way behind your head, glue ham sit-ups, uh, a lot of band crunches and everything. And then for some reason I realized this is all. This takes me like forty five minutes to do. I hate this shit. This is all seems stupid, uh, and I don't know if it means anything to do this. Like I don't know if getting better at banded standing crunches really helps me deadlift more. Uh, and then I went a long stretch, just doing uh, lifts and noticed no difference, which was interesting. That whatever I needed for power thing, I seemed to get by doing power lifts. Earth shattering, incredible. Uh, and then I got to where I, I achieved some really good. That, abs that should be the only by, thing you put on inc- Incredibler dot com. Incredibler. Uh, the set. Then I went that phase where I did, did strongman <laughs> training. Then you go into a phase of strongman training and do a lot of yoke, a lot of farmers, a lot of this, that, and the other. I also did a lot of suitcase deadlifts, which basically, I mean, if you did like a set of three to five to ten reps in a deadlift with just one arm, so you're picking your weight off the ground. I used to do them with bands. So you put a bar in the rack, tie bands around it, and then do a rack pull just with one arm, standing sideways, not against the bar, but standing parallel to the bar. Mm -hmm. So all those things are just monumentally effective at teaching you to not bend (laughs) your spine. So if you want to like train your core to have a six pack abs, then crunches are fine. But like if you want to, if you want to train your abs or your core to increase, your athleticism. Like if you look at, you got to like do a, stuff like what you're talking look about. Look at a guy like Zadrunas Vickis or Misha Kokleyev, one of the top strongmen in the world. Some will be a little fat, of course, because they're huge men and they're not concerned with body composition. But if you if you just take a a focused look at the way their abs are developed, it's insane. Their lumbar spine and their abs they look like they are animations. They only look human. And you know, doing a uh, dumbbell uh, circus dumbbell pressing overhead with 250 pounds in one hand for reps or running with 800 pounds in a farmer's walk, this breeds insane development of your abdominal muscles. So if you, if you want strong uh, abs, I can't think of anything you should do other than that. <laughs> so if you're lifting something off the ground with one hand or pressing something with a single hand overhead, or if you're taking steps, you're loading one side of your body, either from the from the bottom with your legs or from yeah. the top by picking some with your arms, mm-hmm. then you're having to resist. <laughs> that's like the that mount, lateral that's flexion. like the mountaintop of ab training, in my opinion. But uh, mm-hmm. one caveat would be, you still have to ask yourself uh, what you like to improve if you're a CrossFitter and you know, what do you want to get better at. And if you're a competitive CrossFitter, what will you be asked to do? Because like in my experience, I thought I had extremely fit abs based on strength movements, but then like doing a Tabata workout one day. For CrossFit, when I was fooling around with CrossFit some, I noticed I did a set of 20. Hey, this is all right. I could probably do 100 reps of this. The next set, set of 10, and I felt a little twinge. I try the next set, and I go into a horrible full-body abdominal cramp that was just like 10 minutes long. I was just on the ground going, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. I couldn't even straighten my body out. I was like, ah, trying to push away from myself to straighten out. <laughs> yeah, I think he was actually over that class. CTP, CTP was coaching. Yeah, but there, there's that specificity thing where you can have insanely strong abs by doing tons of farmer's walk. And that's going to be very great for you. But if you think that that will translate to you being able to do a glute ham sit-up or just regular sit-ups for reps and some other thing because you think you're a tough guy, you're going to be just blown apart. Well, that, so specificity diff- still rules. 
You have to have some ability to do all this stuff. I have to work on some of it. Even if it's not a focus, you have to maybe do some sit-ups, you know? Well, I mean, I think that's the difference by finding the balance between yeah. uh, core flexion exercises and, and, and anti-lateral. So sometimes you have to uh, learn these lessons the hard way. Yeah. So it makes sense to have somebody just tell you, <laughs> but that's too easy to just accept the lesson without having to go through the mistake. Yeah. It's not nearely humbling enough if somebody tells you. So you have to roll yeah, you around the floor like a, like, a, like a fish that's dying. <laughs> oh, God. Fighting it futilely. And okay, the, the last core exercise or last core uh, movement slash unmovement would be anti-rotation. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I would say my favorite anti-rotation exercise would be a kettlebell snatch. Mm-hmm. Um, if you can do a nice heavy kettlebell snatch, then you're probably pretty good with anti-rotation. Mm-hmm. Um, so how does that work? Wh- one of the things uh, I, uh, what I was want to talk about was uh, with the snatch. I think um, Matt Hoff did mm-hmm. kettlebell snatch in one of the technique ones. Paleonow.com. Paleonow.com. That's okay. right. Matt Hoff. Um, he Friend of the show. That's right. He came and did a seminar with us. It was great. And he was telling us the importance. And it's one of those things that I had overlooked as a coach was um, not keeping your your shoulders square when doing a snatch. Mm-hmm. So I think, I you know, in my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to let myself turn too much when I do kettlebell snatches. But he made it, you know, paramount. Mm-hmm. Like, do not let your shoulders twist when you're doing a kettlebell snatch. Keep your chest pointing forward. Don't let that happen. Mm-hmm. You really think about it. If you're holding a kettlebell... Say you're snatching a 70 pound kettlebell and you got it in your hand you're, and it's swinging down and it's pulling you and you're twisting. It's probably not too good for your back to be under that load and experiencing torsion. So, um, anti extension falls in that category, keeping those shoulders nice and square mm-hmm. and letting the hips drive that power and not, you know, your back bending. So, mm-hmm. um, that's probably my favorite anti extension or anti uh, rotation. Mm-hmm. I know, Doug, you. I think your favorite. I think I know what it is. Oh yeah. Let's see what you say. Or do you want me to guess it? Um, oh, this is like your engagement I'll, party. I'll, game. Make, I'll make it harder. Uh, what's my favorite for beginners versus advanced? Oh, Ooh. dude, I don't know that one. How close is your relationship? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We're not real friends. <laughs> uh, you marry this guy. I know, you know this bromance is over. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe. Uh, I guess the little the little band don't twist thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly. Put the out and you don't move. That's what we. That's what we write on the programs when we write them. Is the the banded, banded don't, don't twist, twist thingy. thingy. Mm-hmm. All <laughs> and sorority stuff. girls love that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I know you. You like the program, the Palaf Press. Yeah, I like Palaf and, Presses and, uh, for. I, I like it too for beginners, yeah, especially. Palaf press. Especially and, tall kneeling Palaf Presses where you're kneeling down on both legs. And then the the, the more what advanced folks, you really like the standing Palaf. <laughs> I was gonna say standing full contact twist with the with the handles. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. That That's actually I, we don't do those. Well, the reason we don't do them too much is because we have limited equipment in space. Yeah, and you're not gonna. This is one of those things that you do on your own. Mm-hmm. You need a landmine or a what? What is it? We have grappler. A grappler. A grappler. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's a Louis Simmons so, deal, well, right? Rogue makes those little things you can you can attach onto the bottom of the Pyrex now. Oh yeah, cool oh, dude, the yeah. There's you always a, a new slug. thing by Rogue coming out. <laughs> that, but you know what? That makes a lot a of job. sense, dude. That modular concept makes a lot of sense. I can't it stop does. spending money because they keep on coming out with brilliant pieces of equipment. All right, so Some, sometimes they miss. Sometimes they miss. I don't know. All right, so no, you want to explain what those two movements are for people that don't know what they are? What do you mean? Oh, the palo. Most, most people don't know what a palo <laughs> press is or a full contact <laughs> twist. <laughs> uh, palo press, uh, you, uh, you're probably going to use a band in your place. Uh, most crossfits have bands and not cable machines. So a palo press would be, you know what? I, we're we're going to do technique yeah. watts and all this stuff, but, By the way, this, this but you the, can tell them this anyway. This is the banded, not, don't bend, you, you tie, you tie a band around a post. You get uh, some tension on it. Uh, best thing to do is go from the knees, especially in the beginning, grab the band in the hand, pull it to your chest, and then from your chest with tension on it, the band is pulling from your side about 90 degrees. You're going to press that band out away from you, and it's gonna, you're going to basically resist that change. So you're going to try and keep nice and straight. Hold that for 30 seconds. Find a band in a distance that works for you, and, and uh, you could probably change the progression by using thicker bands or creating more distance between you and, and whatever you hook that band to. If you're in a more traditional gym setting, you could just use a cable machine, and you could use different weights. It might actually be a little bit easier to, to set up a progression but that I, way. But yeah, but I, I think in this situation, 
bands are beneficial. Mm-hmm. That elastic tension during ab exercises is really nice in my experience. Not that it's really worth anything. But like that using a plate, the mechanics of those plate machines and that kind of stuff, I don't feel like you get a consistent active pull against you. But it's kind of hard to articulate what that means exactly. But I mean, that, it's that different band is gravity. pulling back more aggressively to try to get you to twist versus yeah. the weight where kind of sometimes you can move the weight to position. That's the hard part, but keep it there. Maybe it's not necessarily that hard. That makes sense. Some of those, some of those devices don't. Yeah. Maybe, maybe if, uh, maybe the wheels aren't too greased too well. And yeah, the band just works pleasantly. I think it, the band is worked it doesn't, up. It doesn't seem like it should be different, but I agree with you. It, it does feel different. I can't different. necessarily wrap the words on what that means, but like when you do certain exercises with the band... It sounds silly, but I agree like, as like well. A band, like, a, like, a, like a tricep <laughs> extension is kind of similar where a, you can do like 100 pounds on a tricep extension in, in a gym, and it doesn't really feel like maybe you're doing anything. You could you could double the weight, and it almost feels the same. But a band, that, that, active, that active tension of the band trying to retract you back as you're trying to extend against well, it. I understand if like you're doing something where you're moving because the band's getting longer and the tension's growing bigger as you as you go through the movement. But yeah. it, an isometric hold like a pallet press, it shouldn't make a difference, but for some reason it does feel tougher. It's a qualitative difference. Anyways, let's we move on. <laughs> <laughs> we spent way too much time on bands versus In cable. In the weeds. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. right. Uh, and then the other one, what was... What, uh, the full, full contact con- twist. I'll let you uh, you explain the full contact twist. Yeah, I'll probably do technique wad technique wad on that movement I, here I in the near future. That'd be the best way to go you about. You have it, to now. I know. You I just told everyone to. you would. I know. Announced it early. Uh, so keep, keep your eyes out for that. Um, basically, what it is is uh, you you grab the end of a barbell and then the bar is just um, extending down toward the floor and you're on this side, and then you swing the bar over your head to the other side, and while you're doing it, you're twisting your feet kind of like you would hit a baseball where you would twist your back leg, uh, and then you just go back and forth. And if you have handle attachment, it kind of goes in a V like this. All it does is increase the range of motion that you're taking the bar through, and it makes it feel a hell of a lot heavier, and it's a hell of a lot harder. So I'll do a technique while on that in the future, but that's my favorite resisting um, rotation exercise. On that note, if you don't have enough rotation in your hips, then you're going to then you're not going to be able to do that very well. Yeah, so. I see a lot of people that aren't as uh, experienced, and I, I've done it. I made the mistake myself is is end up with a lot of a uh, lot of rotating in my back, and then and then you're like you're you're bending your back. I go in that. In oh that, yeah, oh yeah. I I knew that in that mobility where you also show like some hacks how you do it if you don't have a grappler. Put in a corner, maybe lay a oh, sandbag yeah. over to keep it in place. Grab the handle. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times I don't even put it in the corner. I just put it in the middle of the room and it works fine. It stays fine. Like, especially with the handle on it. Cause it's not moving so fast. It's not like flopping around. Yeah. I, but the handle is a lot slower and more controlled. I prefer the baby method. You just get a small child. You just place it over put the, lay the, the baby over the barbell. Yeah. Lay the, and then or sh- shove the bar sh- in the barbell in the baby's mouth. <laughs> 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 well, that's just, that's just rude. Oh, hygienic. <laughs> uh, the only thing that we really didn't mention today that's, kind of in that category that some people mention um, whenever they're having this kind of discussion is is getting active hip flexion with a neutral spine a lot of people don't don't train hip flexion above 90 degrees um you know proactively uh, and as a result we were kind of talking about this during the during the break or before the show I was I trying to get you to talk about this earlier it's finally come around jeez so what ashley does to you she's like Ugh. I wanted you to talk about this, and you were like, I don't know when you wanted me to talk about <laughs> why that. Why not or just why ask you me to talk that. about it? A- Ashley's my <laughs> other wife. <laughs> what was your girlfriend's name on the other show? No, she was my, was that my other wife or my girlfriend? I don't know. I derailed the conversation, though. So anyway, <laughs> um, so active hip flexion with a neutral spine. And basically, that means training, um, training hip flexion above 90 degrees. A lot of people can't do you know, this top range of motion very well because they have very weak um, iliacus and psoas muscles, which are which are muscles that run from the top of your leg um, up onto your lumbar spine. Will so, people learn about this in maximum mobility? Um, yeah, they'll, they'll learn about that a little bit. Uh, I, don't, I didn't actually, truth be told, don't go into this specific core training in that product, but I do talk about having range of motion issues and how that affects, mm-hmm. um, how it affects your stability which is kind of what we're talking about right now. So, but I, I don't, I wouldn't, I don't prescribe or suggest any movements to fix that kind of uh, core training in, in the future. You want hear my Rocky, my Rocky soundtrack? Oh, Doug's ring. Is that your fiance calling you? No, this is my, it's time to go to bed ringer. What's with you guys having alarms to tell you when to go to sleep? 
It's all about productivity, Chris. <laughs> all about productivity. Uh, really you know, if, if, if you, <laughs> that's my go to bed alarm. If like past my bedtime, Chris. If you had our schedule and like owned your own business, you could sleep in as long as you want. You could go to bed whenever you wanted. Can you imagine such a life? It would be terrible. It would. It, if you don't have alarms to and th- you know structures in place to to remind you to your live life a normal drift life, into an aimless void, right? Pretty much. If my wife went out of town for a week once, and I just stayed up later and later every night, and then I would wake up at the same time, and I was just more and more tired as the <laughs> week went on. I was like, I was like, all right, I'll catch on. I will sleep tonight. I'll go to bed early. Nope, just stayed up even later. <laughs> you demand a regimented <laughs> lifestyle. I need I need somebody to say your alarm's going off. You need to go to bed. You're right. <laughs> did you did you finish that point about the neutral spine? Sorry. Your... <laughs> I'll make sure the readers. This is why we don't do. Don't. This is why we don't do podcasts at night. Yeah. This is all CTP's fault yeah. for suggesting. Well, Doug can close this fault. point. And we can make closing comments. We have, we have derailed the conversation more than we have in the last few shows on this show. It's fun. Uh, so anyway, um, sorry. If if you can train a uh, active hip flexion above ninety degrees. Um, with a neutral spine more often and you, and you can strengthen your your psoas and your, and your iliac muscles um, then you're less likely to get a synergistically dominant rectus femoris which is one of your quads the only quad uh, that crosses your hip as well it's that middle what, one that sticks out yeah it's one we'll say it's the one right here because that's usually kind of where you feel it when you pull it um, but that's why that happens oftentimes if you can't use your psoas very well or you have a weak psoas then um, you'll overuse that that one quad that acts also as a hip flexor, and then that's how people very frequently pull their their hip flexor or their their quad when doing things like sprinting. So if you do have to do something like sprinting very frequently, then it might it might be in your best interest to include that type of training um, in your in your program. So um, low level exercises be dead bugs, and you can you can Google this stuff. Be things like like dead bugs. Um, that's probably my favorite thing because they, they look like Pilates. They look like you're not doing anything, but inevitably every time I ever show this to anybody, um, they think they're really hard. I, I like uh, you know getting that 240-pound football player in mm-hmm. who can do everything well, and then you give him dead bugs, and he's like, oh! And he's, <laughs> like, he's like, which exercise do you hate the most? The dead bug. <laughs> uh, that's how, that's how, uh, well, that's how the last football player we trained was, so was for like, sure. Ch- yeah, Chase was that way. He's like, can I back squat? You know, 350 pounds for five sets of five, please. I want to do that instead of dead bugs. I'm like, you're insane. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So that, that's probably the one that I use 90% of the time, and, and there's ways to scale that. Maybe maybe I'll do it. I'll, I'll throw that in the technique wad too. But banded. Uh, but I want to throw that into the very end because that's that that fits in the same category. For Absolutely, me. yeah. Very cool. I remember the first time I did bugs. Did dead bugs. It was so hard. You should do them too. All right. Brilliant. Yes. All right, Doug, what do we talk? We're going to close it up. What do we uh, What do we plug in here? Uh, well, I think the most logical thing is to promote the... Most logical? Mo- logical lo- thing? Log- logical. The mo- okay. No, the most logical thing... The most thing logarithmical. Is to- logarithmical. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to pro- promote the mobility seminar because it really fits with all the stuff we've been talking about. Today, we, pr- we primarily talked about stability and core training for our stable joint, which is our low back, even though we talked kind of about the... the uh, core altogether, but the mobility product basically talks about how to make all your mobile joints more mobile and then also how to um, how to keep stability at what I'm going to call your stable joints. And And I, I talk about that concept all the time and I mentioned a little bit here today, but uh, it really ties in very well with all the core training that we talked about today. So if you want to if you want to kind of learn more about what good technique is and how to train each one of your joints for their very specific needs, then the um, product maximum mobility in the fitter shop um, can really tie together everything that we talked about here today. Chris? Uh, yeah, well, speaking of fitter shop, you can go to the fitter shop and check out Simple Strength. <laughs> is that what I named that? <laughs> <laughs> the Strength Seminar. It's actually quite good. Uh, it is quite good. Enter the promo code Rogan for a 10% discount. <laughs> 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 Not true. Uh, check that out if you want. And then uh, you can go by my blog. Come read what I post there on the blog. Just put up a post today on a novel, very super simple take on how to approach getting better at some skill you're new at. I basically boiled down what you should understand about periodization into like five little points and Somebody posted that it was just what they needed today to help them keep perspective when they went to the gym. So go there, read some stuff, see what you think. 
reach out to me, send me a message. I'd love to talk to you. So that's that's about it. Thechrismoreblog.com. That's about all I've got. I read that article today. I like that. Was, it was, it's occurred to me that- To the can, point. Were you yeah. the guy? I was no, I wasn't the guy, but I, oh, Chris, that arca was so good. <laughs> Thanks, hot chick on Facebook. I created an account. Took yeah, took, took my sister's picture. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you, just, you just call your sister hot on on the show. Oh jeez. Oh boy. My sisters are both really ugly. All right. Oh wait. For <laughs> no, the record, no, 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 you can't say that. No, oh, no. Sorry, Lindsay. She watches this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I probably shouldn't have said her name. <laughs> All right, uh, make sure you go to the Pitter website, uh, fitr TV. That's how you spell it. Go there, check it out. Sign up for our newsletter so you can get updates on things we're doing next. And check out the Barbell Shrug coffee mug. That that that'll Shrug hold your that'll hold your coffee and keep it warm. And uh, and any drugs you might want to put in there too. Yeah, I feel like people believe you the way this episode's been going. <laughs> We've gone off on enough tangents tonight where they're probably C- starting to wonder what are in our CTP mugs. Can uh, it's out. not coffee. CTP can edit this stuff out. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we always he'll, say he'll, that. He'll edit out the whole episode. Hey, CTP, could you edit this out? He's like, oh, yeah, I got it. And then I'm watching. I'm like, he did not edit that out one bit. Thanks oh, a lot. He's, he's a busy guy. He has a lot to do. I don't know if he's lazy or just wants to see us embarrass ourselves. <laughs> a little both, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said it's mostly embarrassment. All right. See you guys next week. All right. What a terse close. Uh, see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. That was probably the more, one of the more fun ones we've had. Yeah, I, I, mean, I felt like that was a good mix there was, of content. There was plenty of